Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. Welcome to the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. We're looking at Leviticus chapter 7 today. Now, in Leviticus chapter 7, Moses <laughs> receives laws concerning preparation of the trespass offering, the peace offering, and the burnt offering. And the trespass offering, the word, the Hebrew word is the guilt offering. Each offering, you're going to see in this chapter, that each offering is very personal. You know, we tend to relate to our faith from in an institutional context. But that was not how the ancient Hebrew thought. And it's emphasized in this chapter, and you're going to see it, that uh, there was no way they were allowed to telegraph their relationship to God through an institution of religion. But yet in our society, where we have not-for-profit corporations and denominations and ministerial affiliations, and we tend to, and we're more identified with the infrastructure of religion than the God who's uh, intended to be the focus. And so we're going to see the very personal nature of the worship of the ancient Hebrews, which again, it speaks to us. The Old Covenant is recorded in the Old Testament for us, upon whom the ends of the age have come. God is saying something to us about our relationship with Jesus. And you're going to see in each one of these offerings, and specifically the guilt offering, is always dealt with by the blood. Our works, our efforts at compensation, at compensating God uh, for uh, dealing with our guilt issues, do not move the hand of God. But the blood of Christ, in our behalf, moves the mountains in our life. Mountains of shame. Mountains of guilt. Uh, there's multi-billion dollar discipline, industry in the earth dealing with self-confidence, dealing self-help, the psychology, psychiatry, all dealing with the weight and the burden that folks carry around, mm -hmm. either imposed by themselves, their past, or imposed by others. And God has one very simple answer. And it's the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And we're also going to see here in this chapter that uh, the mystery of why Jesus was raised the third day and not the second day or the fourth day. Why wasn't he raised, you know, two weeks later, you know, a few hours later? There were reasons for that connected with his priesthood. So again, we're giving attention to reading. This is expositional Bible study. We're going to get our whole Bible back, and we're going to see that you get your whole Bible back. Amen. <laughs> and we're going to begin Leviticus chapter 7, beginning verse 1, read verses 1 through 7, if you would. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> You're so sweet. Likewise, this is the law of the trespass offering. It is most holy. In the place where they kill the burnt offering, shall they kill the trespass offering, and the blood thereof shall he sprinkle round about the altar. And he shall offer of it all the fat thereof, the rump and the fat, and that covereth the inwards. The two, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by flanks, and the coal that is above the liver with the kidneys, he, it shall he take away. And the priest shall burn them from... The altar for an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a trespass offering. Every male among the priests shall eat thereof. It shall be eaten in the holy place. It is most holy. As the sin offering is, so is the trespass offering. There is one law for them. The priest that maketh atonement therewith shall have it. So first of all, you see there in verse 7, uh, addressing the semantics of a trespass offering or a sin offering, and God is making the statement there, they're one and the same thing. And how does that speak to us? Trespass offerings have to do with how we sin against one another. Mm. Sin offerings have to do with how the ancient Hebrew would sin against God. But he says they're one in the same thing. Your sin against your brother. Mm. 
is a sin against God. Yes, sir. As we read yesterday in, in chapter 6, it said, if we trespass against the Lord in lying to our brother. And so how we deal with one another. Eve, that's why you, it's in your best interest to love your enemies because God takes it personal even when you hate your enemies. Because it's the life of God beating in the breast of that person who is motivated to make your life miserable. That's right. It's his creation. <laughs> so when you look at someone, that's one thing. I had a vision where uh, I, I saw Re Revelations chapter 8 the lamb seated upon the throne and the Lord said, this is how I look at you. When I look at you, I see the lamb. I'm not looking at your performance. I'm not looking at your character or lack thereof. When I look at you, the father told me, I'm, I'm, I see the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And then he went on to tell me, he said, and to the degree you see the lamb when you look at others, I will then pay the dividends into your life of the fact that that's how I see you. That is how God sees you. Well, if that's how God sees me, how come I'm not experiencing the blessing? Because even though that's how God sees you, when he looks at you, he sees the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. But you only enjoy the benefits of the fact he sees you that way to the degree that you look at others, even the unregenerate, and see the lamb. And if you don't see the lamb in them, then the benefits of the fact that God sees you that way are withheld from your life. That's right. Because God is love. He wants us to... You cannot hate your brother and say you love God. That, James said, that's a lie. First John, John said, that's a lie. So here in verse 1, it talks about the law of the sin or trespass offering. And again, in the Hebrew, the word is the guilt offering. Uh, somebody was talking about their mother one day, and they said she's God's travel agent. She can send you on a guilt trip around the world mm -hmm. with all the scenic stops along the way. Oh, my goodness. You know, Mommy says, well, that's not my little boy. <laughs> my little boy wouldn't do that. And we manipulate, in our culture, we manipulate people with guilt. And unfortunately, religion does that as much as any other institution in the earth. But yet, God's dealings with his people from the very beginning was assuaging guilt, removing shame. God does not do blame. He does not do shame. And he has no vested interest in guilt remaining in your life for one split second. We often, when we think of guilt, we think of it as something uh, to get away from us and deal with as quickly as possible. Of the three types of offerings God makes available, one of them, of course, we see is the guilt offering. God wants to deal with guilt. Religion uses guilt to manage its adherence. But God removes guilt from us. Every time the guilt subject comes up in the same sentence, every time that word guilt comes up in the law, the same sentence talks about the shedding of blood. God's answer to the guilt question is the shed blood of Christ, mm -hmm. not remonstrating with you over religious performance, moral quality, or the turpitude of your character. God addresses the guilt and the shame by the shed blood of Jesus, he, his, his autonomic response in, when he encounters guilt is to ameliorate it, is to alleviate it through the shed blood of Jesus. When you feel guilty, there's a difference between guilt and conviction. But when you feel guilty, when you feel ashamed, when you feel less than, God's response is always the shed blood of Christ. Amen. The guilt offering, notice in the passage here, it was defined in verse 2. I believe it's verse 2. No, verse 1, it calls it most holy. Now, that's very important. Verbiage in the Bible is everything. What do you mean, most holy? Some things are somewhat holy. <laughs> and you know, Although, it would be interesting to see that in the Bible. It is a thing somewhat holy. <laughs> Some things were holy... Some things were most holy. Some things were considered holy. Other things were considered most holy. You need to know what the difference is. It's very important. 
Because the first mention of, in Exodus 26.33 of something being most holy was referring to the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. So, every time ever after in Scripture where something is referred to as most holy, it's connected with the glory of God and is connected with the mercy seat. Build yourself up, the apostle said, on your most holy faith. That is the faith that is connected to the glory of God. The Philippians 4.19 said, God, I'm going to meet all your need according to my riches and glory. And that's not meant through the measure of faith. That's meant through the most holy faith. We need to grow as believers from having the measure of faith to having the most holy faith that, that will manifest the substance. I heard one pastor say, uh, there is the faith... All of us that are Christians have faith in God, but he said, you, ma'am, have the faith of God. That's the mountain moving stuff, mm -hmm. stuff that mountains are moved by. So every time you see something as being defined as most holy, it always has a special connection mm -hmm. with the Ark of the Covenant, the glory of God, the cherubims above the mercy seat. It has a specific, intimate, relational connection with God, and the trespass offering was considered most holy holy uh, and God's response in dealing with that you see in verse 2 that the blood thereof shall he sprinkle round about the altar in other words our guilt God's autonomic response you poke your finger in my eye I'm going to blink God's uh, that's an autonomic response God's autonomic response to your guilt is the shed blood of Christ his, his autonomic response is not judgment if God's autonomic response to guilt and shame was judgment, he would have never sent Jesus. Mm -hmm. He would have never gave them coats of skins to cover their nakedness because of the consequences of disobedience in the beginning. His response is always mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Our guilt is always dealt with by the blood. Psychologists, how does psychology try to deal with with guilt by means of blame shifting, talking you out of your guilt, by suggesting your sins are not your fault, you're a product of your environment. Well, I just can't help it. That's just, you don't know what I've been through. <laughs> no, you are overlooking the shed blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. In the shed blood of Christ, the vagaries of your the environment you grew up in that have made you the rascal that you are become irrelevant when they are quenched, when they are plunged, like the hymnist said, in the crimson flow of the shed blood of Christ, and you are cleansed and forever changed. Thank you, Father. <laughs> well, I don't feel guilty. Oh, really? To the degree we level blame, mm -hmm. the degree or your capacity for leveling blame, or what Jesus called having an opinion is the measurement of the guilt that you carry. Wow. The penchant that you have for leveling blame is a measurement of the guilt that you carry. When you point the finger, you are simply establishing the fulcrum uh, whereby your own guilt is measured. And that's why I just love the law, every time you would see the pointing of the finger under the law, it was always dipped in blood. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. You see, go point of the finger, then you stop and you look at it like it was a smoking gun. You know? so, <laughs> so oh, oh. And so you point the finger and you say, you're forgiven, and you sprinkle him. You're forgiven. You sprinkle it seven times before the veil. You're forgiven. It's <laughs> beautiful. Consider the cynical definition of guilt found in the medical dictionary. I want you to listen to the verbiage here out of the medical dictionary. Guilt is defined as feelings of culpability. <laughs> That's good. However, listen how it goes on. Especially for imagined offenses. Wow. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. Did you hear the, the hypocrisy and the hatred in that statement? Particularly imagined offenses from a sense of inadequacy. Morbid self-reproach. God isn't reproaching you. You're reproaching yourself. So we try to solve it by making ourselves our own judge and deal with our guilt by becoming independent and rebellious and stubborn 
and becoming a rule unto ourselves. I'm okay, you're okay. I may, you don't you try and make me feel guilty because what's right for me is right for me and what's right for you is right for you and you don't have a right to encroach upon my sense of morality. That's the, the, uh, uh, that's the approach of the atheist. If subjectivism, relativism, um, uh, situation ethics uh, are a valid means of justifying ourselves, then God does not exist. And we know that he does. Mm -hmm. Morbid self-reproach. See, yo, your sin, you know, the scripture says your sins have separated you between you and your God. Oh no, that's you're just reproaching yourself because the the world, fallen nature, humanity says, and this is right out. This is this is right out of a medical dictionary. Is saying no, uh, you're your own god. If you're if you feel reproach and heavy hearted, you're just you need to uh, remember that you are your own god. Oh, you you are your own standard. Nobody can can judge you often manifest in a marked preoccupation with moral correctness of one's behavior. Oh, that's just an unhealthy preoccupation with good behavior. You just don't need to be preoccupied with that. You need to be preoccupied with comforting yourself, self-soothing, -sooth mm -hmm. and doing what, if it feels good, do it. That's the healthy approach to, to uh, the personal psychology of a human being based on the medical dic dictionary. Heaven, hell, and you know what? It's not working. <laughs> and all you got to do is look around you and see all of the focus of the cult of celebrity and all the focus on externals and the, and the worship of, of youth and outward beauty is trying to cause ourselves to shine outwardly because inwardly we're full of darkness and unhappiness. Did you hear me? Mm -hmm. See, God's intention is that you not be bound to endlessly carry guilt and shame around in your lives, but to be pronounced free by the efficacy of the blood of Christ. Look at Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Leviticus 17 tells us the life is in the blood. What does it mean, made nigh in the blood of Christ? Because God looks at me, he accepts me because of who Jesus is. He accepts me because of what Jesus has done for me. What I have done, who I am, is eclipsed in the efficacy of the blood of Christ. And God deals with me as though I was his own dear son because of the covenant that Christ cut for me on Calvary. Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who Jesus is and what he did for me, through the eternal spirit who offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Amen. Dead works are works of, mor of moral excellence by which we try to buttress ourselves and defend ourselves against self-loathing. See, dead religious works. Or we go the other way, we become what they call a profligate, where we just cast aside all right and wrong. And that's pretty much what's been done in, in civilization today. There is no right and wrong. I am my own God. I am my own standard. And no one can judge me. Well, that's not working either. Look at the world around us. First John 1 John 1.7 If we walk in the light as he is in the light... We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. When you, know he, when you know he accepts you, some people cannot stand to be around others. They are so needy. They are so full of self-reproach. They are so full of self-loathing that they absolutely cannot stand to be in the company of others. It is a completely dysfunctional environment where that person is around their peers because you're constantly having to hold their hand to address their, their issue. If they're not the center of attention, they feel like they're being attacked uh, because they have not come to their sense of self. You need to get your sense of self-referral from who Jesus is in your life, Amen. not getting your sense of self-referral from the fact that everybody's putting their attention on you or because uh, you like what you see when you look in the mirror. 
Uh, I love what one of my mentors, he had just a wonderful sense of humor. He said, you got to give the devil a quick comeback. He said, I get up in the morning and he'd look in the mirror and the devil would say, boy, you're ugly. And he'd say, so what? I'm married. He said, you got to give the devil a quick comeback because my sense of self-referral does not come by looking in the mirror and I see uh, the body of Arnold Schwarzenegger, the good looks of Hugh Grant, <laughs> you know, or Donald Trump's bouffant hairdo and the budget that goes with it. Uh, those things are not where my get, I anchor my sense of well-being. My sense of well-being, the scripture says in Colossians 3, set your affections on things above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. My sense of self-referral is anchored in who God is. That's why they didn't know they were naked till they lost their God consciousness. Where self-consciousness rules and cripples us, God originally intended the seat of self-consciousness to originally be the seat of God consciousness. And you're so conscious of God, you don't even pay attention to all that other stuff. That the God consciousness on the inside of you eclipses self-consciousness. And you become, as your father, a fire from your loins up and from your loins down. And you become the one that sits on the throne of rule and authority with an emerald rainbow round about you because you are seated with Christ. You are in Christ and He is in you and as He is so are you on the earth and you have the solace of Himself on the inside of you regardless of what's going on around you and then you are no longer a slave to circumstance or a slave to self but you are a ruler and you are a master immersed in the person of Christ and living your life as a principality and a power in the earth. Glory to God. Thank you, Father, for that. How many want to sign up for that? Amen. Thank you, Father. And verse 4 talks about when the offering was handled, it specifically mentions special handling of the kidneys and the liver. Mm -hmm. The kidneys and the liver represented the emotions to ancient peoples. The Babylonians used the liver in rites of divination, foreseeing the future. The liver had a prophetic something uh, to, the, to their thinking. The liver and the kidneys to ancient people were regarded much the same way as we think of the heart. We know that you know, our, our blood pump is, is not really our, our heart, but yet we put our hand over the heart and we say, this is how I feel about it. Mm. Because we see, we just have a sense in our culture of the heart being the center of self. But the ancient people, their idea of what we call the heart, their idea of the seat of their emotions in their life, I saw it as coming from the liver and the kidneys, which is why Jesus made the statement, he said, out of your belly shall flow rivers. Of living water. I'll never forget a uh, young man that I was mentoring uh, had a tremendous boldness and a hypocritical preacher one time tried to put him on a guilt trip and and uh, this young man he liked to eat and he liked to enjoy his food and this uh, uh, manipulative preacher looked at him across the table one day and said your God is your belly which there's a verse about that people that worship people that have uh, their appetites are more uh, uh, important to them than serving God. So he pointed the finger at this young man. Uh, your God is your belly. And the young man quoted the verse, Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. He said, My God is in my belly, he said. <laughs> that was a quick comeback. They offered him to go on a guilt trip, and he said, Thanks, but no thanks. My God is in my belly. That's beautiful. <laughs> He must have spoken by the Spirit. So in offering, when they offered the kidneys and the liver, it was telling the ancient Hebrew, you're giving of yourself, your emotions. There was nothing dispassionate. You sit in, you, you watch churches, and you know they'll shout themselves hoarse and spend hundreds if not thousands of dollars to be on the ball field, but they go to church and they, you know, they'd have to, they, the, from the way they look, you'd have to go to a funeral to get a smile out of them. They're just, well, that's religion. We don't get emotional about it. But you need to understand that from the earliest times, they were taught to serve with passion and with everything that is within us. That's what is meant. That's the biblical reference of giving our lives to God, 
of giving our giving our hearts to God. We're giving of ourselves to God, and God is giving of Himself to us. And this is what Romans 12, 1 refers to when he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And uh, in verse 6, it's also interesting that in each of the offering, there was always a portion of the offering that the priest would eat most of the time. Some offerings they did not eat of. But so when the sin offering was made, they had to eat it. And the day the sin offering was made, it had to be eating. That's why the Bible says, today if you hear his voice, now is the day of salvation. Mm-hmm. They never waited. There's one offering we're going to talk about here in a minute that was not eaten until the third day. And matter of fact, he said, you'll be considered an abomination to your God and among the people of Israel if you eat it before then. There was one offering you could not eat till the third day. There was another, but the sin offering had to be eaten now. God's ready to forgive you now. Amen. Well, when I get my life cleaned up, when I straighten out my life, when I get my head together, I'm just trying to find myself. No, it's now. Now faith is. Now. <laughs> and the Amen. picture of the priest eating the sin offering is a picture of Christ taking your sins within himself. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that God made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Now, let's understand 2 Corinthians 5.21. For God made Jesus to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God. Notice it didn't say God reckoned our sin upon Jesus that we might be reckoned to be righteous. No, Jesus becoming sin was more than mere reckoning. Now you're on holy ground when you have this conversation. Jesus was made sin. You know, a lot of people don't believe that. You ask that enough ways and you'll find most people do not believe that Jesus became sin. And if you suggest he did, you're considered a heretic. But if Jesus was not made sin, then I cannot be made the righteousness of God. And most Christianity and most theology today behind our teaching do not believe that we truly are the righteousness of God. They simply believe that God is being merciful and reckoning righteousness to us, but we're not really righteous. Well, if we're not really righteous, then Jesus didn't really become sin and we are still in a fallen state. But let's listen to the same chapter. Now that was 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Let's go back up. He said, if any man, verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. How do we become a new creature? Verse 21, because he made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, are we a new creature? Are we just reckoned to be a new creature? Like, okay, I'm going to give you a second chance, you rascal, you. You, know, you better not do that again. <laughs> See, the term there where it talks about you're a new, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, the term implies actual Transformation. If you look at the wording, it means any man. if a man is in Christ, he is a new species altogether. There is verbiage in the New Testament that says that Jesus was the last Adam and the second man. In other words, he concluded the Adamic race and initiated a new race called the new creation. And we are a member of that race. We are brought out of the race of Adam the fallen race, into the new creation in Christ Jesus. It is not just imputed to us or merely reckoned to us, but is an actual change. You know, God's not capable of that kind of reckoning because anything he thinks just just happens. Anything he thinks instantly comes about. He's not capable of doing that little two-step in your head. Well, he's really, you know, a wretch born in sin. But I'm going to reckon righteous. I'm going to impute righteousness to him. No, we are forensically righteous. First Peter one twenty three says we are born again by the incorruptible seed. That's why you're not adopted like you think. Mm-hmm. Oh, I've been adopted into the family of God. No, that isn't what that means. <laughs> Our idea of adoption is you get get a, a a child who's not blood related to you, and you reckon that child legally to be your son or your daughter. 
That is not how the new birth works. 1 Peter 1.23 You've been born again of the incorruptible seed. Amen. You are a new creation. You are a new species altogether. Not an orphan. <laughs> See, the word ad or adoption there, he's given us power to become the sons of God, whereby we receive the spirit of adoption, crying, uh, Abba, Father. That word adoption means to be set as a son. And in the, the culture where that was written, they would take a boy at 12 years of age and they would teach him the family business and the daddy would take him out into the marketplace in front of all the people he did business with and said, Behold, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And everybody knew from that moment on he was he had experienced the awios, we call it bar mitzvah today, by which he now, everybody that, that does business with the son knew it's the same as doing business with the father. Amen. That's the spirit of adoption that you've received. You are truly born again of the incorruptible seed. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus, immersed in the blood of Christ and transformed because Jesus became sin for you. And then in verse 7, it describes the process whereby the priest, in giving this offering, he's making atonement. For you, we are atoned for in the shed blood of Christ. Now, are you ready to know what atonement means? I need you to put your snorkel gear on because I'm fixing to kick over a sacred cow. The word atonement, see, we are atoned for in the blood of Christ. The result of bringing the trespass offering and the blood being shed, the giver, the worshiper, was atoned for and brought into right relationship with God by the spilling of blood. The word here is atoned is the word copper. K-A-P-A-R. Copper. I may not be pronouncing it right, but what it means is we are covered. Somebody asked the other day, is it legitimate to say I plead the blood or I, I we are covered with the blood. That's what atonement means, to be covered. We need to pause and think about this. See, Jesus made a statement, if, if the blood is our covering, we need to, there's a principle we need to consider, and it's by the blood we are born again. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 23, 9, Call no man your father upon the earth, for there is one that is your father which is in heaven. Do not call any man your covering. If the blood is your covering, then you don't need the covering of man. I submit to you that, the, that only the blood of Christ can cover and every other covering is a religious misconception at best and manipulation at worst. When we look at Abraham and Lot's relationship, we see that Abraham was not fully secured in his destiny till he sent Lot away. And Lot's name means covering. Some of us are laboring under the false idea that the pastor or some leader is your covering and you are robbing yourself of full engagement in the purposes of God because of it. You need to get the lot out of your life. Mm -hmm. And when you get the false covering out of your life and let the blood of Christ cover you as God intended, then you, he's going to manifest the substance and cause you to be ushered in to the full bandwidth and the full scope of the blessing of God. And any pastor who's truly God called and operating with the mind of Christ where you're concerned is going to say yes and amen to that, uh, that truth. Amen. That verity. That's awesome. Can you handle that? <laughs> it's like my brother, it. <laughs> my brother went to a church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He came back to tell me, so I never sat in a church like that. The preacher would be preaching. He said, Do y'all agree with that? And half the congregation say, No. And the guy keep right on preaching. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> if you'd read verses 8 through 17 for me. And the priest that offereth any man's burnt offering, even the priest, shall have to himself the skin of the burnt offering which he hath offered. And all the meat of the offering that is baked in the oven, and all that is dressed in the frying pan, and in the pan, shall be the priest that offered them. And every meat offering mingled with oil and dry shall all the sons of Aaron have, one as much as another. And this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he shall offer unto the Lord. 
If he offer it for a thanksgiving, for thanksgiving, then he shall offer it with the sacrifice of thanksgiving, unleavened cakes mingled with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil and fine of fine, fine flour fried. Besides the cakes, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving for his peace offerings. And of it shall he offer one out of the whole oblation for the heave offering unto the Lord. And it shall be the priest that sprinkled the blood of the peace offering. And the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings for the thanks for thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day that it is offered. And he shall not leave any of it until morning. the morning. But if the sacrifice of his offering be a vow or a voluntary offering... It shall be the same day that he offereth his sacrifice, and on the morrow also the remainder of it shall be eaten. But the remainder of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burnt with fire. So again, some hmm. offerings were eaten on the same day, other offerings were eaten on the third day. Notice that the peace offering were cakes or bread. Jesus said, I'm the bread mm -hmm. of life. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. And it was cakes smeared with oil. If you look at it, and if you study uh, and and look into the Jewish commentary on this peace offering, it was very specific how the oil was applied. It wasn't just mixed with the dough and baked. The oil was to be smeared. If you look up the word Christ in the New Testament, it means the smeared one. And now Jesus is our peace. And he was smeared with the oil of the Holy Ghost in his earth walk. The, this is the law of the peace offering we see. Uh, the Hebrew word there is salom. It's where we get the word shalom as well. It's a peace offering or it's a requital offering. Hmm. It was also seen as a friendship or an alliance offering. As the sin offering was connected with the Ark of the Covenant being called most holy, the peace offering was not connected with the Ark of the Covenant. The peace offering was connected with Abraham's personal relationship with God because James 2.23 says that Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. And that word friend is, doesn't mean he was just somebody God liked. The, it comes from the Arabic word effendi and it means he was the blood covenant partner of God. The Israelites understood Abraham to be the blood covenant partner of God. And as Abraham's seed, that blood covenant was passed on to them. When a generational covenant like that was observed, it would occasionally be brought into remembrance by the shedding of blood. So when they offered the peace offering, they were ratifying again. It was a memorial offering. Ratifying in, their, in that gift in that offering, that this is my connection. I'm bringing God to remembrance that I am an inheritor of the blood covenant agreement he made with his friend, his blood covenant partner, Abraham. Amen. It reminded God and reminded the worshiper that a covenant of blood existed. This includes us. The entire book of Galatians is devoted to the fact to, to prove that you and I likewise are inheritors of the blessings of Abraham. Thank you, Lord. See, even if Jesus wasn't resurrected as an inheritor of the blood covenant of Abraham and in the line of Jewish kings from Abraham to David, from David to Jesus, even if he had been a mere man, the fact that he allowed himself to go to the cross and shed his blood, in his thinking he did it as a covenantal act of giving himself away to the, to the whole world by laws in the ancient times that govern blood covenant, any co ancient court would have to acknowledge that any member of the human race that accepted Jesus and what he did would be an inheritor of the same covenant that King Jesus. He was not a king because, just because God said. He was in the line of kings. Don't forget. Mm -hmm. He was the federal head of the Jewish people. And when he gave himself away by the shedding of blood, even if he was a mere man, there is not an ancient court that existed that would not say anyone 
who accepted his terms, which is believe that he's the way, the truth, and the life, would then become a covenantal partner with Abraham, and there is not a Jewish or Israelite person who could legitimately deny it and could not deny it today if they would judge what Jesus did because they mm -hmm. know that Jesus came from the line of kings, mm -hmm. and they know that he covenantally died. He saw his death as a covenantal death, and the terms he established were, I'm giving my Myself away to the human race and all you have to do is believe it and any Jew who believed his own Bible would have to believe and accept the fact that we are his brother by the shed blood of Christ established going all the way back to the blood that was shed in Genesis 15 when God cut the covenant with Abraham. Thank you God. What a master plan. <laughs> Unleavened cakes, verse 12, mingled with oil, which is a picture of Christ who is our peace. The smeared one. I just want to get smeared. How about you? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Verse 15. And notice again it says it shall be eaten the same day. It talks about God's timing. The concept of the day of the Lord refers to God's set season. You can set your own season Amen. in God. Amen. We're not waiting on God. If you understand you can set your own season in God, you're not waiting on God. We're not waiting on God to do anything. When it says wait upon the Lord, it's talking. It's like the waitress you call over to your table. Mm -hmm. Come wait on me. Mm -hmm. In waiting on the Lord, we are serving Him. It's not God sitting back with His arms folded and said, I'll bless your life when I get good and ready. No, He's already made a now provision for you. Thank you, Lord. See, Jesus is your peace. Romans 5.1 Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. You know, you watch the Westerns. You better make your peace with God. I don't have to make peace with God. Jesus is my peace. He made it for us. Jesus made a peace that cannot be broken. I cannot, I don't need to make my peace with God. I have peace with God. Amen. Romans 14, 17. <laughs> the kingdom of God is not righteous, is not meat or drink. It is righteousness, peace, and joy. In the Holy Ghost. The peace we have with God is not a human thing. When we think of peace, it's like, would you just, like the kids are cutting up, and they're acting up, and, and or, or Deacon, good example, our little golden retriever, and he's just sitting there, and he's going from around the coffee table, and he's looking at us, and he puts his paw up on us, and he... He just won't give us any peace. We just want him to leave us alone. Because our idea of peace sometimes is just being left alone. <laughs> but that's not God's idea of peace. We think of peace, we think of mutual combatants refraining from molesting one another and leaving each other alone. God's peace, the peace with which we have with Christ, implies, listen, it's God being covenantally engaged in every area of your life. Amen. And you being covenantally engaged in the purposes of the kingdom. Your life is not your own. But you are serving in ministry portion that which is greater than yourself. Sorry. Your life is not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore serve God in your spirit and in your body. And then it talks about the sacrifice. That was not eaten until the third day. And it was abomination to eat it before then. Verse 17. Here the prophetic theme of the third day is reflected in the sacrifice. Some offerings were to be eaten the same day and others on the third day. <coughs> and the term third day appears 38 times in scripture. And many times in connection with the resurrection and with miracles and with uh, creation. Jesus was raised the third day. And that was the day he presented himself in the heavens. We read that verse a little earlier about Jesus presenting himself in the heavens. Why? Did, when did he do it? On the third day. Because Hebrews 4.14 says, Seeing we have a great high priest passed into the heavens. When did he pass into the heavens? On the third day. Jesus, the Son of God. He, went, he didn't go to heaven on the second day because he couldn't do it till the third day because the bread that he was could not be partaken of until the third day. Amen. And that's why he waited until the third day and didn't hang around till the fourth day. He said, Touch me not, Mary, for I have not yet ascended to my Father and to your Father. Yeah. 
And he took as our high priest, he took the sacrifice of himself up on the third day that we then might be partakers of the sacrifice from that point forward. Thank you, Lord. The third day. <laughs> wow. So why did he rise on the third day? Not the first or the fourth day. Because as our high priest, he had to appear before the Father on the third day and ratify the new covenant for us in the heavens. Mm. Interestingly enough, there are 1,000 year days in God's timetable as well. And we are currently in the third 1,000 year day from the resurrection and the seventh 1,000 year day from cre creation. If you want to know more about that, read Hosea chapter 6. And this is just a great stopping place. We're on it's such a verse powerful parable. 19. Yeah, for tomorrow. Uh, uh, actually, we didn't read 18. Oh, 18, yeah. yes. But it's such a beautiful parallel, my goodness, to be able to connect the dots from the front of the Bible to the back. We've, we've been so, you know, versed in the New Testament most of our Christian lives. But to be able to see his purpose from the beginning and your, the law of first mention, which we've talked about since Genesis, it, um, it gives you, it's like it solidifies our foundation for where we stand. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can turn around, right? Right today, you can preach this stuff to your friends, your neighbors, to whoever, because this is not copyrighted. This is in the scripture. You know, it's the truth yeah. and revelation of. Yeah, the we're Lord. not making this stuff up. No, and you can <laughs> you can preach it and teach it, and that way it uh, kind of locks in to to where you are, and it gives you a firmer foundation to stand on. I love that, Father. We thank you for this precious time in your Word, and we thank you that you you've just done wonderful things. You've built a bridge, Father God. You're a bridge builder. And you've helped us to connect the dots from the Old Testament to the New, that we can have a stronger foundation to stand on. And, and Father, now you can build a skyscraper. As we learn more of your word, our roots go down deeper, and there, we're able to stand, and having done all to stand on your word, we can stand, therefore, with confidence and boldness that when we come before you, we know about the covenant, and we understand more about your word and your your precious blood, Jesus, and the third day resurrection life that already is at work in us. So we want to thank you for it, and we bless you, Lord, and we bless the people that are listening and learning with us. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.